Hello, my fellow scientists. Today I want to talk about iron battery 1.5. Last week I talked about the attempts we've made to simplify this chemistry and the things we've tried to eliminate or replace, and basically none of that worked. So here is the not quite version 2, updated in terms of form factor and composition, but not really in terms of the active chemistry. I think it's good enough to use for a number of applications. I don't think it's quite where it could be, but uh, you can look for the updated publication in Hardware X when we get there. In the meantime, here's the version that we have working pretty well. So here's a diagram of the basic iron battery. You have carbon and iron on one side, you have carbon and iron three on the other side, and as electrons pass out of carbon, they pass into the iron three through that conductive carbon, and you get electricity through your load. This has some advantages over lithium ion batteries in that it is cheap per kilowatt hour, but it also has some serious disadvantages. It's not at all high energy or high power. When we published the Iron Battery 1.0 paper, the energy and power were so low that it was borderline useful, but we've made some improvements since then. So let's talk about how that works. We still use the iron metal as the anode and ferric iron chloride as the cathode. Those become both ferrous iron of various kinds, not totally clear what, and the way this is going to work is that you're going to have some counter ion, potassium or sodium, pass through the separator. Now it could be that the chloride or hydroxide ions are passing through the separator, but I don't think that's the case because we've used ion selective separators and it doesn't make any difference, and those only allow potassium and sodium. So I'm pretty sure that what we're really dealing with is the uh, cations. How are we going to set this up? We're going to take iron chloride in the ferrous state, we're going to dissolve that, add potassium sulfate, so now we have iron ions, chloride ions, potassium ions, sulfate ions, and we're going to precipitate that with sodium hydroxide to pH 7.5. We do the same thing with ferric iron, FeCl3, again same conditions potassium sulfate and precipitate to 7.5. Um, as for the composition, you can see here, you can make it yourself, it's a pretty straightforward mix. We're shooting for about 2 molar, but everything's quite approximate uh, because we're not making it volumetrically. In terms of the build, we weigh out the appropriate quantities of iron chloride, in this case it's ferrous iron chloride, and then add the sulfate, again the appropriate ratio there. When we hit that correct, we're going to add an appropriate volume of water. Now I'm using sodium sulfate, but per the iron battery 1.0 we really want to be using potassium sulfate because, as you'll see, sodium sulfate doesn't work as well. How do you know how much sodium hydroxide to add? This is actually really important. If you add too much sodium hydroxide, it goes basic. If you don't add enough, it's acidic, and it won't work at either of those conditions. It won't be reproducible. So here's the basic procedure. We're going to make some very concentrated sodium hydroxide, about 30% by mass, dilute that 1 to 10 as our titrant. We're going to make our iron chloride solutions that I just showed, weigh a quantity of that iron chloride solution, about 1 gram, Dil use your dilute sodium hydroxide to titrate to pH 7.5 and note the volume, Divide that by 10 because we're going to use the concentrated stuff and add that amount as appropriate to the mass of the iron chloride solution to neutralize it. Once you have your iron chloride mix, you're going to add a tiny bit of weighed iron chloride solution to a beaker and titrate that using dilute sodium hydroxide. Now I say dilute, I mean about a 1 to 10 dilution of the stock solution so that you get a better read on how much volume you need to get to pH 7.5. I have an Ido titrator from Vernier, that means that for every droplet that goes in we take a pH reading and we know the volume of the droplet so we can get a good read on droplet versus pH. Once you hit pH 7.5 you're going to precipitate with the appropriate amount of sodium hydroxide to reach pH 7.5 calculated from the titration. Now we're using the concentrated stuff this time so we don't use as much volume. You can see that precipitates rapidly to form this sort of blue sludge for the ferrous case and a sort of red-brown sludge for the ferric case. And it takes a little bit different volume each time for the two different compositions. It also takes a bit of agitation to get that to incorporate fully. Once you have your uh, Precipitated mixture, we're going to add the appropriate mass of carbon. This is Ketchenblack. It's a conductive carbon. The ferric iron 
suspension pretty easily mixes with the Ketchin Black to make a sort of paste. The Ferris is a little tougher to incorporate. We had to use a mortar and pestle. I put that ferric iron mix with the carbon into the void space of the cell. And then I'm using a little silicone to seal it and then add the membrane. The one we're using in this example is a paper membrane with cellulose acetate. So you dissolve cellulose acetate in 20 mils of acetone, saturate the paper, and then let the acetone evaporate. You could use Nafion applied to paper and dried. That works quite well too. Or you can buy a nice pure Nafion membrane from various sources as well. I'm going to use a little more of the silicone grease to seal that. Weigh out a bit of iron and then finally divide that. Put that iron into the void space of the second half of the cell and then pack that void into the iron with the ferrous composites. This is the ferrous chloride plus carbon all precipitated. Again, grease that joint a little bit. You could certainly use a silicone sealant instead of a silicone grease, but for this particular cell that worked okay. Sandwich that, you can see I use a little too much, it starts to spread out. Um, we're going to clip that with a binder clip and then use the machine screws to seal that together thoroughly. It gives 1.13 volts and when I connect up this resistor in series we get about 23 milliamps, which is a significant improvement over old batteries. Once we assemble that we have this final design all ready to go. It actually performed quite well, so you can see that the discharge was about 5 milliamps and it could hold that 0.8 volts even under 5 milliamps. We could then charge it at 5 milliamps and discharge it several times and it held up reasonably well. But over time we see that the end voltage is getting lower and lower so the state of charge is dropping despite the fact that we're adding the same amount of charge every time. Uh, we, we're, not, we're not holding that amount of charge and we usually interpret this as consistent with non-rechargeable behavior. So I still recommend you stick with the Iron Battery 1.0 chemistry that's in the publication, which I'll link to in the description. I don't think you can substitute basically anything at this point. And the performance, if you don't substitute anything, is a very long-term stable battery with very decent current and modest energy. So thank you all for watching. This is gonna be my last video for a while. I'm going on sort of a long-term hiatus. Uh, we will try to get updates out when there's significant progress, but for the time being, this has been Peter Allen for The Allen Lab.